All right. What follows is one story of hundreds of stories that comprise the Kwangju uprising in May 1980 in South Korea. During that week-long uprising, hundreds of people were killed by their own military. Hearing a grandmother shout, they've killed him, as I watched a young man being beat to death is a sight I cannot unsee, and it's a voice I cannot unhear. Witnessing the uprising burned a hole in my heart that will never fully heal. It was day three of the uprising. I was a health worker in a small village near Kwangju, sitting on the floor of my small room, wondering what was my life going to be? Did I have any future here? A knock changed that. Mr. Kim, the village leader, and three other village leaders had worried looks on their face. We heard that there are many people who were killed in Kwangju. Is that true? Yes, that's true. The soldiers killed many people, mostly university students. People are really angry. There are no buses today. The phones are not working. Mr. Che here has a daughter at Chanam University. So does Mr. Nam. My son is at Chanam University. There are other families in our village. We've not heard from our children. They're worried. He paused. Will you go back to Kwangju? I nodded. There was an in instant relief on their faces. They had a side discussion, way too fast for me to keep up with, and Mr. T Kim turned back to me. OK, we're going to get the list. Call them when you get to Kwangju. It sounded like a curt demand, but the look on their faces of the men around him told me how worried they were about their sons and their daughters. The same muddy ruts welcomed me as they had yesterday. Thick foliage on the edge of the road quickly gave way to the rice fields to the south and the hills to the north. Birds bounced along the branches, and that scene really calmed me. The sound of a motorcycle coming from some village past mine snapped me back to reality. I flagged him down and hopped on the back. The motorcycle, motorcyclist let it rip, and after almost tumbling off the back, I gr death gripped the seat underneath me. My suicidal motorcyclist dropped me off in Nampyeong. It's the first small town after leaving Kwangju heading south. It served the transport industry in all sorts of ways. The small town was never going to be on any travel guide, and any reference to it was going to have the word rough in it. I continued towards the main road. Every shop was closed. At the intersection, there seemed to be more people milling around than the entire population of Nampyeong. On the street, where buses normally disgorged and sucked up passengers, there were no buses. So where, why was everybody here? Near the bus stop, I joined a group of people, automatically rummaging into my backpack for my Korean dictionary. The fear and the anger that I had seen in Kwangju the last couple of days was not to be found here. Everyone was talking too fast, and their Chanam dialect meant that I struggled to understand the threat of words. I really felt like an idiot. But bit by bit, my ear picked up the conversation. They were talking about Kwangju, but not just Kwangju. They were talking about things that had happened in Naju and even further south in the seaport of Mokpo. Typical Korean formality and reserve had been completely abandoned. The words, the gestures, the laughter, the smiles, something momentous had really happened in these places. Everyone, young and old, was excited the sound of an approaching bus startled me. It was coming from Kwangju rather than going towards the city, so I figured not much use to me. Still, I thought, well, at least the buses are running. As it neared, the crowd on the street parted, and they belted out a cheer to welcome it. A large banner sagging at the front said, Release Kim Dae-jung. All windows were broken out, and the occupants, who were mostly young, were happily chanting and banging sticks and ball bats and metal rods against the side of the bus. Their joy was infectious. Kim Dae-jung was the favorite son of Chan-nam, 
and was the most well-known opposition figure in the country. His demand for democratic reform had galvanized students across the country, particularly here in my corner. The military government feared his influence, and they decided it was best to keep him locked up. Another massive cheer erupted from the crowd when everybody stopped, the bus stopped. A couple of halimones in threadbare hanboks started dancing together. The two old women were happily circling each other, lost in their own little world. An electric current ran through the young people on the bus, into the crowd, and through me. We were all lightheaded. Almost euphoric, this gritty little town seemed like the center of the universe. Two young men and a young woman standing next to me introduced themselves and in excited voices began describing the events of the previous night in Kwangju and in Naju. We did it, we kicked out the bastards. What, the military is no longer in Kwangju? I was still trying to come to grips with the scene and its implications. Most of Kwangju, soldiers still hold the provincial building and the train station, but the rest of Kwangju is free. We heard they've even left half of Hall of Jeonnam province. Their voices brimmed with excitement. This was their moment and they were giddy with delight. Yesterday afternoon, it started. People got fed up. The bus drivers and the taxi drivers, they led the way, they created a barrier protecting people, and some rammed the military vehicles. So we're not under military control, the people now in charge? Their eyes lit up, yes, no more soldiers. Wow, came out in English, but my friends understood immediately what I meant. The crowd moved a short block away to where the police station stood, and we went with the flow. The station looked forlorn, its door locked, no policemen around, the crowd swelled and an argument broke out between two men near the front. They were talking way too fast for me to get the gist of it, but my newfound friends were glued to the scene and one of the young men told me they're arguing about the armory in the police station. A burly middle-aged man walked past the two and with a loud crack, he broke the lock on the front door. It crumpled under the force of his massive wrench and he flung the door open and a handful of men rushed into the small structure. On the two st street, the two men who were arguing, events had overtaken them. Men brought out guns and ammunition and handed them to everyone and anyone who would take them. In my mind, shit, what the hell is going on here? The Korean military had planned well, but not planned for their own rebellious public. All Korean men undergo military training and are quite handy with using rifles. Not only did the men who broke into the police station know how to use those weapons, but so did every man on the street. My young friends declined to take a weapon. The young woman commenting, we can't shoot at our own soldiers, but how do we protect ourselves? Her uncertainty unsettled me how would they protect themselves? Within a few minutes, the multitude of reactions in the crowd crystallized into two. One, where some reason that the guns were unfortunately necessary for defense. Others rejected their use for fear of retaliation by the military. The crowd grew to well over 200 people and guns were everywhere. A vehicle uh, carrying about four civilians pulled up to the edge of the crowd and two young men got out and waded into it. Their demeanor really suggested that they commanded some authority and people stepped aside to let them through. Return the guns. It'll only give the military an excuse to retaliate and to kill you. The crowd quieted. After a few seconds, people were handing those guns forward, and a small pile started to form in the front of the police station. A grandfather, dressed in a traditional hanbok, raised his hands into the air, and everyone stopped. 
He was stooped, he was old, but you could tell he was very agile. He had worked the land. He grabbed a gun and he held it aloft. He demanded our attention and he got it. If we return the guns, they can be used against us. The crowd nodded. Break them. His voice, while not loud, reverberated through the crowd. Within a few seconds, the somber mood became joyous again. Young and old snatched up rifles that had piled up in the streets. They gripped the rifle barrels and gleefully smashed the sticks, stalks into the street. Wood shattered and flew in every direction. A new pile formed. This one of wood and metal parts, scratched, bent, and now completely unusable. My friends joined in that righteous destruction. Afterwards, they came back to stand with me. They were flushed but satisfied. A ripple of fulfillment ran through that throng as the last rifles were destroyed. The whole process, from the time the armor was opened until the rifles were destroyed, had taken less than an hour. It felt like an eternity, a time when innumerable emotional states graced that space around me and in me. The scene that had unrolled in front of me didn't fit the military's narrative of riotous students and hoodlums and North Korean infiltration. This was rural Korea. It was not students laying waste to those weapons. It was grandfathers, it was farmers, it was shopkeepers. I felt fortunate to be a witness to the incredible events and, to, and I was insanely proud of the people I lived and I worked with. Over the next week, I was actually trapped in Kwangju. I managed to reach the sons and daughters of my villagers. They were all fine. The horror of the killing of all by the soldiers and now the excitement of their overthrow had really turned me into an enthusiast for the uprising. It was right, it was fair. Still, Peace Corps rules say, don't do anything political, don't get involved in local politics. What do you suppose the grandfather would say? Thank you. Paul Court